Um, and sometimes when I'm talking about faith with people, what they tell me about is the wonderful faith and deeds of their parents or grandparents. At one point in Ontario, I had heard that so many times that I was sure that everybody in the county had a Methodist lay preacher in their background. And I knew there weren't that many Methodist lay preachers. But what people were doing were telling me about their parents and their grandparents. And that's a wonderful testimonial. And it's a wonderful example. But it's not your own. And so until we get to the point where we say, I believe, we're traveling on somebody else's faith. And it's as if your ancestors or mine deposited money in a bank account, and all we do is make withdrawals. Well, you know what happens to bank accounts if all you do is make withdrawals. So it is that we need to say, as well as we are not alone, also to say, I believe. We are not alone. We live in God's world. Being alone can be devastating. One of the great punishments given to prisoners is time in solitary confinement. Mother Teresa, who worked for years with the most marginalized on the streets of Calcutta, was famous for saying that the worst disease is not leprosy and it's not cancer. It's the feeling of being alone, unwanted, unloved, and uncared for. Now, when the United Church Creed was being written in in the late 1960s and early 70s, the world was living under the specter of nuclear destruction. And the best we could manage was mutually assured destruction, which was appropriately called MAD. You try to blow us up, we'll blow you up. And and so there didn't seem to be a way out. And as a minister starting out in the early and mid-80s, there was a whole generation of kids in Sunday school and in the church and in schools who really wondered whether they would make it to adulthood because that was the message. We were going to blow ourselves up. And so it was very important for the United Church Creed to declare in that context, regardless of how stupid we are as humanity and regardless of how foolishly we behave, God will not abandon us. We are not alone. Today, when we look at our inability to deal with our greed and our selfishness and the results in terms of global warming and destruction of the planet, we may very well wonder whether God has given up and walked away and left us to our own devices. But as long as we declare we are not alone, there is still hope. Maybe you look out these windows and you look at our community and you see a problem and you think, There's a problem, but I don't know how to deal with it. I don't know what I can do about it. And then you get a fresh breath of the Spirit, and people come along beside you who share your concern or who are inspired by your passion, and you discover that you're not alone. And wonderful things can happen. We are not alone. That may be the most important phrase in the creed. It's certainly a great place to start. To say that we are not alone in this world. Like I said, people say some odd things to ministers, and from time to time I'll be asked the question, what's the greatest sin? Now, I'm not sure what leads people to ask that. Maybe they're just trying to figure out what they can duck out from under. I I don't know. And I don't have an answer. I do know what the most dangerous one is, and that's despair. To believe that we are all alone, that we can count on nothing and no one, including God. Because that leads us into an ever-descending spiral, thinking that we are alone, that we are without hope, We are are without resources. 
Everything seems impossible. But we are not alone. When life's journey seems to be as dark as it has ever been, we are not alone. When it seems like your life is crashing and burning round about you, we are not alone. When it seems like all that you can think of in terms of life is this long corridor and all the doors out of that corridor are locked and barred, we are not alone. One of the most important things to do with a creed is actually live it. It's one thing to say these statements of faith, but it's quite another when we take them and make them into action. And this is one of those places where we can do that. You can look around, look around you here, and notice who's missing. Go ahead, do it. I'm not just talking to hear myself think. Look around. Look who's missing. Okay? You can make it your job in the next day or two to call that person and say, I missed you. You're not the truant officer, you're not looking for an excuse. What you're saying is, I missed you. My Sunday morning was impoverished, in part because you weren't there. And who knows? Who knows, that may be a person who is thinking, I'm all alone and nobody cares. Wouldn't it be wonderful if they got a half dozen or more phone calls saying, somebody does care when you're not there. So I'm not just talking to hear myself think. I would really like to hear that we crashed the phone lines in Sackville, calling people who weren't present. And not just this week, but every week. I'd like you to think of doing something else, too. Twice each day this week, once in the morning, once in the afternoon, I want you to say to someone, how are you doing? And not just as a substitute for hello. You may have to stop and say, no, how are you really doing? Because, you know, people just expect, how do you do? It's, how are you doing? It's sort of like, hello. And you say, it's a really miserable day. Oh, that's great. And they just keep wandering along. No, I want you to stop and ask, how are you really doing? Because you have no idea whether or not that person to whom you speak, for whom you take those very few moments of care, may be despairing may feel that they are all alone. We are not alone. How do we know? We know because God's people live their statement of faith. We are not alone. We live in God's world. This is God's world. God has not just set it running and then walked away. By the same token, God is not responsible for every little moment of my life, like finding me a slot in a crowded parking garage. That's not God's job either. But God is involved in our lives. We may not always notice it at the time, but we may look back and say, aha, hmm, that's what was going on. But that's the vision of faith. The so-called hard-headed individual may declare, if I don't see it, I won't believe it. The follower of Jesus Christ knows by experience, if I don't believe it, I won't see it. You see, if I don't believe in God's love, the kindness of strangers may be nothing more than the grease that keeps the wheels of society turning around. And if I don't believe that this is God's world, a rainbow may be nothing more than the refraction of light through water molecules and not a covenant statement of commitment. And if I don't believe in God's justice, then those who are seeking to make change are nothing more than hopelessly woolly-headed idealists person of faith sees differently and therefore understands more. We are not alone. We live in God's world. Jonah was a reluctant prophet. 
He didn't want to bring God's message of warning and judgment to Israel's enemies. Jesus came proclaiming that the kingdom of God is round about us. In other words, day by day by day, this world is becoming more and more as God would have it be. And you and I, as people of faith, have the privilege of participating in making those changes each day by what we do and what we say. We are not alone. Thanks be to God. Amen.